Biloxi, Mississippi. A quiet southern town with a burning core of corruption. In 1987, its secret burst violently to the surface, leaving two prominent citizens dead and ripping the top off a grand conspiracy. On Mississippi's Gulf Coast, a judge and his politician wife are murdered in their home. The killer left few clues. It looked like a professional hit, and the investigation led nowhere. But the FBI refused to give up. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Until we could prove that federal laws had been broken, our hands were tied. It would take years to break the conspiracy of silence and reveal the tangled tale of corruption. Biloxi, Mississippi, Monday, September 14th, 1987. It was a typically warm summer night in this quiet Gulf Coast town. The workday was over, and most residents had retreated to the tranquility of their homes. Like most of their neighbors, State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor. Both were fixtures at Biloxi's social and community functions. They were a happy couple who had raised three grown children. Tomorrow they planned to visit their daughter out of state. Their life together seemed ideal. They were just settling in for the night when an unexpected visitor came to the door. And brought their perfect world to an end. The Sherrys were supposed to be with their daughter, so no one realized anything was wrong until two days later when the judge failed to show up in court on Wednesday, September 16th. Calls to the Sherrys' home went unanswered. His colleagues at the court phoned Pete Halat, Vincent Sherry's friend and former law partner. Morning, Pete Hallett. But he hadn't seen yeah. or heard from the judge either. Well, he's supposed to be in court. When did he leave? I don't know. No, wait, you let me call him at home and I'll, I'll figure out where he is. After he left a concerned message on the Sherry's answering machine, Halat felt he'd better check on his friend personally. Oh, I got the machine. Judge! Judge, it's Pete. They're looking for you in court. Is everything okay? On his way out, he asked his junior partner, Charles Legier, to ride with him. Charlie, hold on. Time to settle up. I need some help, so let's go. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'll give you a call back, okay? Yeah. Bye-bye. I figure if we go together, the two of us will find As they drove, Legier tried to make conversation. Uh, well, that seemed distant, 
perhaps concerned about the judge. Both of the Sherry's cars stood in the driveway. Well, the car's here. I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, the car's here. He's supposed to be in court. Halat asked Legere to go to the house while he asked a neighbor if she'd seen the couple. Just go ahead. Azir rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He saw that the last two morning newspapers hadn't been picked up. Pete Halat, I'm a partner. The neighbor told Halat she hadn't seen the Sherry's for a couple of days, which she thought was odd since both of their cars were in the driveway. When Legere tried the Sherry's door, he found it unlocked. Something wasn't right. Hey, Pete! Pete! I think that's unusual. Yeah, I was uh, just knocking on it and the door opened up. Halat, concerned by the Whenever open door, the door open, cautiously stepped inside. A few steps in, he made the gruesome discovery. Judge Sherry had been gunned down in his own home. He was wrong. They called the police. Authorities arrived to find the body of Vincent Sherry at the front of the house. In the back bedroom, they discovered Margaret. Because the couple was so prominent, the murder investigation became top priority. Detectives contacted the FBI's Biloxi field office. Though the FBI would not yet be officially involved, they offered the use of their agents and forensic laboratory. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. They conducted blood spatter analysis to determine projectile angles. If they could figure out where the murderer had stood when he fired the shots, they might be able to reconstruct the crime. Okay. Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, helped process the scene. He discovered a possible clue in the den. There was blood trailing from his feet, actually going down between his legs a little ways, uh, back to where he was laying. There was blood spatter on um, a double sliding glass door that was right beyond his head. And for other examination in this room, I found some um, small pieces of foam rubber. Burris didn't see where the foam rubber could have come from. A search of the house led him to one conclusion. Now this foam rubber had to have been brought into the house. We examined every piece of material in this house and every room of the house, all pillows, mattresses, everything else. There's no foam rubber tore up in this house. It was brought into the house. It does have gunshot residue on it. And basically about the only way it can get there is for a bullet to be fired through it. For Burris, the significance of the foam rubber was obvious. The killer had used a homemade silencer. Investigators dusted for fingerprints, but found none of any value. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol as well as the bullets used to murder the Sherrys. The position of the shells indicated that the shots had been fired in rapid succession. But most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. Nothing at the scene pointed to the killer's identity. 
So what do you think? He did his job well, and his mission was clear. The lack of evidence in this house, such as uh, items stolen, uh, a struggle occurring, the absence of forced entry, uh, no ransacking going on in the house whatsoever, a person came there for one thing, that was to kill the two Sherrys. Special Agent Keith Bell from the Biloxi FBI field office agreed that this was a professional job. The Sherrys had been assassinated. The crime scene appeared to be very limited as far as evidence remaining, which meant it was well planned, well executed, and professionally done. A uh, small caliber weapon had been used. Uh, the uh, foam rubber indicated that uh, perhaps a silencer had also been used, and the Sherry's had been uh, shot in the head. So uh, it, it seemed to be a very professional job. A multi-agency task force was assembled with Special Agent Keith Bell among its members. Investigators would spend days processing the crime scene. They grappled with a single question. Why had the Sherrys been murdered? That was one of the main questions, uh, that being why were both Judge Sherry and Margaret Sherry murdered? Because it was fairly obvious that Judge Sherry could have been killed during his morning or afternoon jogs around the neighborhood. Uh, so it was a real mystery why Margaret had been killed. Investigators believe the answer might lie in the controversy over Biloxi's future. Some civic leaders hope to transform the sleepy southern town on Mississippi's Gulf Coast into a flashy resort where casinos would attract tourist dollars. But with strip clubs already established in town, Margaret Sherry felt Biloxi's small town charms were threatened and the casinos would attract a criminal element. As a candidate for mayor, she had made powerful political enemies by trying to keep gambling out. Agent Bell wondered if Margaret was killed to silence her protests. Margaret had been so outspoken politically in the community. Uh, she was known to be anti-gambling. And uh, if elected mayor in 1989, she had planned to close down the remaining strip clubs in Biloxi. So there was always the possibility that she might have been the target, rather than Judge Sherry. The task force would investigate Margaret's political enemies, but first, they'd question the Sherry's friends and neighbors. Someone in the neighborhood must have seen something. But even people who'd known the Sherrys for years were reluctant to talk, fearing the specter of Biloxi's emerging criminal underworld. The Sherry murders brought a dark cloud over the city of Biloxi. Uh, many of the citizens in Biloxi were uh, afraid to openly express their opinions. They saw that Margaret Sherry, who had been quite vocal, and quite outspoken in political circles, had ended up dead, as had her prominent husband, Judge Sherry. So many citizens, uh, after these murders, uh, were hesitant even to be interviewed by FBI agents or by local police officers because they basically did not want their names tied in to anything to do with this case. If people wouldn't talk to the authorities, perhaps they would talk to Lynn Spazito, the Sherry's daughter. After being notified of her parents' murders, Lynn rushed to Biloxi from her home in North Carolina. Determined to find justice, she questioned everyone in the neighborhood. One family friend gave her a crucial piece of information. He described a suspicious car and driver in the neighborhood on the night of the murders. She took the lead to the police. They identified a man who had seen a suspicious Ford Fairmont driving in front of the Sherry home on Monday night, September 14, 1987. 
Investigators tried to determine the identity of the driver based on the witness's description. Their search came up empty. But a few days later, not far from the Sherry's home, investigators found an abandoned car, a Ford Fairmont. A check on the vehicle's identification number showed it had been reported stolen the day before the murders. Police also learned that the tags on the car were not registered to the car. Realizing that this vehicle was probably the killer's getaway car, investigators towed it to a police garage to examine it further. Somewhere in the car, they hoped to find a key to the killer's identity. Less than a week after the brutal murders of Biloxi couple Vince and Margaret Sherry, investigators received their first promising lead. They recovered an abandoned car, matching the one witnesses described seeing the night of the murders. After contacting agent Keith Bell about the discovery, investigators processed the car for clues. Inspector Robert Burris found something peculiar. I was processing this vehicle, and one of the things I noted, the dome light had been dismantled and the bulb taken out of it. In other words, if you open the door, you ain't got no light. Both of the sun visors were in the down position. Whether you're riding around daytime or nighttime, you ain't gonna be able to see the people's face in it very well. Investigators believed more than ever that this was the car used by the Sherry's killer. Anything found inside it was labeled, packaged, and shipped yeah. to the FBI labs in Washington, D.C. But FBI lab examiners would find nothing of evidentiary value. After Agent Bell arrived, he examined the license tag more closely. He discovered it had its own story to tell. It was determined that the tag on the Ford Fairmont had been stolen from an abandoned vehicle in 1984, actually three years before these murders occurred. So what it meant was someone had removed the license plate, likely in 1984, had kept the license plate, and then when this major crime in the city of Biloxi was uh, to occur, they pulled it off the shelf, so to speak. With no other solid evidence, investigators hoped that following the trail of the stolen tag might lead to the killer. It was traced to an apartment complex where the original car had been abandoned three years earlier. Investigators contacted the apartment manager, who told them that prior to having the vehicle towed, he called a friend to come and strip it for parts. The manager's friend, was a man that agents knew by name and reputation. Biloxi locksmith Lenny Sweatman. He was the last person to be seen near the car. Sweatman belonged to a loosely organized group of criminals the FBI was investigating in connection with another case. The group was known as the Dixie Mafia. FBI agent Keith Bell had connected the car used in the Sherry killings to Lenny Sweatman. Now, Bell wondered if the Dixie Mafia was linked to the Sherry murders. If Sweatman had a part in it, Bell believed that other Dixie Mafia members couldn't be far behind. He began looking into Sweatman's associates. What that meant to us immediately, uh, those of us familiar with the criminal associations on the coast, was that if Lenny Sweatman was involved in getting the tag for the hit car, then quite likely his close personal friend and longtime associate Mike Gillich, the strip club owner in Biloxi, might also be involved in these murders. That's all right. Sometimes you know how it is. Oh, thanks. Oh, beer. All right. Gillich, who owned three strip clubs in Biloxi, was well known to local law enforcement. He was currently under investigation by the FBI in connection with a Dixie Mafia operation known as the Lonely Heart Scam. See, he gets to it. 
but Special Agent Bell needed a thread that connected the two investigations together. He started by familiarizing himself with the Lonely Heart scam. It was run out of Angola prison in Louisiana by a man named Kirksey Nix, the incarcerated kingpin of the Dixie Mafia. No, the first model. Nix would run ads in gay magazines, asking for money to help fictional gay men get out of trouble with the law. Through the scam, Nix was hoping to generate enough money to solve his own legal problems. He was serving a life sentence for murder. From his jail cell at Angola, he coordinated what we've been referring to as the homosexual scam, which generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals around the country, uh, as well as some people in Canada. Uh, with this money, he intended to buy his way out, or attempt to buy his way out, of his uh, Louisiana prison sentence. Believing that they were helping gay men out of trouble, people who read the magazine ads would wire or mail money to a nearby Western Union. Nix would then call his contact on the outside, Mike Gillich. Gillich would then dispatch his bagman to retrieve the money. Gillich made sure that the scam money was distributed to Dixie Mafia members and safely stashed away for Kirksey Nix. Take care. In the coming months, investigators developed more evidence in the Lonely Heart scam, but still had no direct link between these conspirators and the Sherry's killers. A year into the investigation, the murder case threatened to stop. As the years stretched to 16 months, the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spazito, grew increasingly frustrated. In January 1989, she hired a private investigator to rev up the inquest into her parents' murder. He said he could make out the man. I'll give him a call, and I'll be on this case this afternoon. The family had wanted very much to have a quick resolution to the case, but by uh, early 1989, there'd still been no arrest. And of course, at this point, the FBI had not formally uh, entered the case. The lack of official FBI involvement hampered Bell's investigation. So when the private investigator paid him a visit, Bell welcomed his assistants, hoping they could share information. The two were old acquaintances from the private investigator's days in law enforcement. Since Agent Bell was unable to act officially, the private investigator would pursue a lead that looked promising. He would interview another Angola inmate. The private investigator and Bell hoped the inmate at Angola could finally link the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. He uh, met with all the right people, and because of his knowledge of the Dixie Mafia uh, and from what he had learned from law enforcement authorities on the coast, he did go over to Angola and did talk to the right person over there. The inmate's name was Bobby Joe Fabian. He was another known member of the Dixie Mafia, doing time for kidnapping and shooting a state trooper. Fabian claimed he had not been involved in the Sherry murders, but he had learned that fellow inmate Kirksey Nix had been. Fabian told the private investigator that Nix had had Judge Sherry killed because Sherry had allegedly stolen money from Nix's Lonely Heart scam. That wasn't all. He said Nix had been told of the theft by none other than Pete Halat, Sherry's former law partner. Halat the man who had delivered the eulogy at the Sherry's funeral was now implicated in their murders. Halat officially represented Nix on legal matters, but Fabian said Halat's role in the Lonely Heart scam was criminal, not legal. Halat was one of the people receiving money from Nix for safekeeping through Mike Gillich's bagman. 
don't forget to pick up next week at the other place. And the ties between the outlaw and the lawyer went deep. Kirksey Nix's girlfriend and accomplice, LaRae Sharp, worked in Halat's office. Fabian said both LaRae Sharp and Pete Halat were stashing money from the scam in a safe deposit box for Kirksey Nix. And he said the amount had reached six figures. Thanks to Fabian, the link between the murders and the Lonely Heart scam had been made. And not only had Fabian given investigators a possible motive for the killings, he was also able to supply the name of the alleged hitman, an ex-con named John Ransom, who was believed to be living in Georgia. But tracking down Ransom would take time. Anytime law enforcement uh, people get together and start talking about notorious Dixie Mafia members, John Ransom comes up quite early in the conversation. He's a longtime alleged hitman for the Dixie Mafia. In August of 1989, two years after the Sherry murders, Agent Bell now had enough evidence to warrant a full FBI investigation into the killings. Accompanied by the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Sposito, he approached the United States Attorney and the FBI with a demand to officially open the case. So with the tying in of the scam to the murders, we knew we had some federal violations involved. We have uh, wire fraud, we had mail fraud, and we perhaps had a hitman traveling from Georgia to Mississippi to kill the Sherry's. Uh, it was decided to open an official FBI investigation and join with local authorities in the investigation. By now, however, suspect Pete Halat, Judge Sherry's former law partner, had been elected mayor of Biloxi. With a key suspect in such a high position, investigators encountered new roadblocks. It became very difficult for the FBI to share all of its information with the local authorities. We are not uh, saying that the local police were corrupt. What we are saying is that Mayor Halat put his own people in as director of public safety and as police chief. So we were somewhat circumspect on what we, we shared uh, with local authorities during that time period. In August of 1989, as investigators attempted to unravel the truth about the Sherry's murders, informant Bobby Joe Fabian made a surprise move. He told his story about the Sherry murders to the TV news. Fabian hoped that by bringing attention to himself, Kirksey Nix would be less likely to have him killed for cooperating with authorities. Along with the report, the station broadcast a mugshot of John Ransom, the alleged hitman in the Sherry case. When Charles Legier, Pete Halat's junior partner, saw the photo, it surprised him. He recalled seeing Ransom outside the Sherry Halat law offices a few weeks before the murders. Hello. Legier shared his information with the task force. Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department took Legier's statement. Legier said the reason he remembered Ransom was Ransom stepped off of a curve and came up to him and asked him where had spent Sherry's office at. When Legier was interviewed, me. he recalled there was something unusual about the way Ransom stepped off of the curve. Ransom had a prosthesis on one leg. Investigators learned that Ransom was now in a Georgia prison, serving time for another murder. When questioned about the Sherry murders, he refused to cooperate. 
as Cook further questioned Legier about the day he and Halat had found the bodies, an important detail emerged. Legier remembered that Halat had walked into the Sherry's living room, seen Judge Sherry's body, and said, Vince and Margaret are dead. Cook relayed this to Agent Bell. What was interesting was that Margaret's body was in the far back bedroom of the residence. And according to Chuck Legere, Pete Halat did not have time uh, other than to briefly enter the front of the house and would have no way of knowing that Margaret's body was also in the very back bedroom. In October of 1989, two years after the murders, Agent Bell knew Halat was involved but he still lacked enough evidence for an arrest. Even so, he felt it was time to confront Mayor Halat. It would be a quiet warning, man to man. And I let Mayor Halat know that I thought his knowledge of the Sherry murders was much greater than uh, what he had shared with law enforcement authorities up to that point. And I recall also telling him that the FBI would continue working on this case until it was totally solved. Uh, my recollection is he smiled and did not have much else to say. As a lawyer, Halad knew Bell would need more concrete evidence in order to secure a conviction. What he likely didn't realize was the depth of Bell's commitment to bring him to justice. Three years had passed since Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were murdered in their Biloxi, Mississippi home. FBI Special Agent Keith Bell had connected the killings to members of the Dixie Mafia and to Judge Sherry's friend and one-time law partner, Pete Halat. The alleged trigger man, John Ransom, was refusing to talk. In January of 1990, Agent Bell and Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department drove to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary to question another possible accomplice. This is special agent. A man named Bill Rhodes. Rhodes, a known associate of John Ransom, was willing to cooperate. He told them that in early 1987, Ransom had contacted him about driving the getaway car in a crime to take place in southern Mississippi. Ransom had said a judge would be murdered and that the pay was $10,000. There were certain promises made to Rhodes that, by Ransom that I know certain people in Biloxi that if you'll help me on this and you'll have the run of Biloxi anytime you want it. So in March of 1987, Rhodes went to Biloxi and met with Ransom and a man named Pete. It was Pete who specifically asked Rhodes and Ransom to do the hit. Rhodes said he also met with Mike Gillich, the Biloxi strip club owner, who would supply the money once the hit was done. But five months later, before they could do the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge. And Ransom got cold feet, afraid Rhodes would turn on him. The information helped the case inch forward, but Agent Bell and Officer Cook still felt that Ransom held the missing pieces. Another year would pass without much progress. In late 1990, the investigators went to the Bostick Correctional Institute in Georgia, where Ransom was serving time. Finally, Ransom agreed to talk. He admitted that he delivered a 22 caliber pistol to LaRae Sharp, Kirksey Nix's girlfriend. But Ransom insisted that he did not do the job. Based on what Ransom said, LaRae's involvement was starting to look bigger than simply stashing scam money in a safe Sir. deposit box. Sir. All finished? Finished. Thank you. Good. Through his contact with Sharp, Nix learned that the investigation was heating up. 
He worried that his girlfriend might talk. So he tried to head off the problem by putting out a contract on her life. But in late 1990, Agent Bell arrested her for her participation in the murders, inadvertently saving her from Nix's gunman. During a polygraph test, Sharp denied her involvement in the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. But the machine called her bluff. When Bell and his team added her statements to their existing stacks of evidence, they were ready to bring indictments against several key players. Mike Gillich, John Ransom, Ray Sharp, and Kirksey Nix were charged as conspirators in the Sherry murders. Notably missing from the list was Pete Halat. The case against Halat would have to wait until they had enough evidence for a murder conviction. For now, the FBI would look to convict the others on conspiracy to commit murder. So many of the questions came up, why didn't y'all indict Pete Halat early on when you indicted everybody else? Well, at the time, we didn't have the hard evidence that you would have to have to arrest a mayor and prosecute him. The conspiracy trial produced several key witnesses that would help investigators piece together the complex scheme. Robbie Gant, Gillich's bag man for the Lonely Heart scam, testified for the prosecution. His testimony helped prosecutors link the Sherry murders to the scam. All four defendants were found guilty. Nix was given 15 years in addition to the life sentence he was already serving for murder. Gillich also received a 15-year prison term. Ransom got 10 years, and LaRae Sharp won. With these conspirators behind bars and the Lonely Heart scam no longer operational, Bell moved on to his next objective. We decided not to end the Sherry investigation after the 1991 uh, initial convictions because at that time we had not proven who had actually uh, shot the Sherrys. And also Pete Halat had not been indicted or convicted at that point. And we all felt strongly that Pete Halat had played a, ma a major role in the scam and in the murder plot. So we were determined to continue the investigation to see if we could get enough evidence to indict and convict Mr. Halat and the actual shooter. In late July of 1992, Agent Bell got the break he was looking for. Following the conspiracy trial, Mike Gillich was desperate to find a way out of prison. He contacted one of his associates in Biloxi and asked him to approach Robbie Gant with an offer. Gant told Agent Bell about and the associate had offered Robbie Gant $20,000 if Gant would recant his testimony against Gillich and sign a false affidavit stating that he had been threatened by me to testify against Gillich, uh, to testify falsely against Gillich. Gant agreed to wear a wire and get the offer from Gillich's accomplice on tape. Gant met with him in Mississippi. This time, Gant's tape was rolling when Gillich's associate reiterated the bribe. Gant accepted as Bell had instructed.
Now, Bell had the evidence he needed to turn up the heat on Gillich. Just the man who could tell the story from the inside. By 1993, six years after the double murder of Vince and Margaret Sherry, FBI agent Keith Bell had put four members of the Dixie Mafia behind bars. But he still had no formal murder convictions against those involved. And Mayor Pete Halat, the suspected mastermind of the case, was still free and running the city of Biloxi. In fact, the year before, Mayor Halat had broken ground on the city's first big casino. The victory for our town and our people. The press still hounded Halat about his involvement in the Sherry murders, but he remained adamant about his innocence. Bell continued to work his plan. He used the bribe Robert Gant had recorded on tape to level another charge against Mike Gillich, already in jail. Now Bell indicted Gillich for witness bribery and witness tampering for trying to buy off Gant. And that did the trick. No doubt the most important uh, turning point was in October of 1993, when Mike Gillich finally decided to cooperate and tell the story of this whole case from an insider's point of view. And that's what really uh, allowed us to bring final resolution to this investigation. After the years of painstaking work Bell had spent on the case, it was a satisfying moment. Finally, it seemed his patience and ingenuity were paying off. Gillich was in no hurry to accrue more jail time. Bell's relentless pressure had persuaded him to cut a deal before the bribery trial even began. The Dixie Mafia member would tell what he knew about the murders. Mr. Gillich has Maybe now, Bell could get the convictions he knew were long overdue. But for a career criminal like Mike Gillich, Adjusting to life on the right side of the law wasn't easy. At first, he tried to bluff his way out. Well, of course, it always takes some time, a period of weeks, to develop some degree of uh, trust and to be able to uh, communicate with someone like this who, for the first time, has decided to leave his lifelong role as uh, a criminal and start cooperating with the FBI. When deception didn't work, Gillich had no alternative. He had to tell the truth. Now, for the first time, Bell heard the story from an inside source. Gillich knew all the details. Mike was the center point. Mike knew Kirksey Nix. Mike knew Pete Hallett for years. And in fact, when Kirksey Nix was looking for an attorney over in the coast area to represent him on various matters, Mike Gillich introduced Nix into Pete Hallett. He confirmed that Pete Hallett was indeed behind the plan to murder the Sherrys and that the plot grew directly out of the Lonely Heart scam of Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. Some months before the Sherry's deaths, Halat had closed the safe deposit box he and Nix's girlfriend, LaRae Sharp, had access to, effectively cutting off her access to the money. He then transferred the money into a box only he and Judge Sherry could use. Motivated by greed, he stole $100,000 cash from there. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Halat could blame the theft on Judge Sherry. Next, he went to Mike Gillich with news of the theft. Mr. Gillich stated that Pete Halat approached Mr. Gillich himself in late 1986 and told Mr. Gillich that much of the money was missing, supposedly around $100,000. 
and Mr. Allatt blamed Judge Sherry for taking the money. Uh, Mr. Allatt knew that Kirksey Nix would be very furious about this. It is not known who ordered Margaret's death, but as a fierce opponent of corruption, she posed a threat to the underworld forces hoping to control Biloxi. With Margaret dead, Halat could be free to run the town. Gillett said that he and Halat planned the murders. Ransom and Rhodes provided the murder weapon. But when they passed on doing the hit, Gillich found a replacement, a Texas-based petty criminal named Thomas Holcomb. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. Gillich had also helped provide the car with the help of locksmith Lenny Sweatman. In October of 1996, agents arrested hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. Peter, that same down. month Going also up. saw the arrest that Agent Bell had anticipated and worked nine years to achieve. I'm an innocent man, and you're gonna put the cuffs on me? Let me read you your rights. The arrest of Pete Halat for the murders of the Sherrys. Kirksey Nix and LaRae Sharp were indicted on 52 counts, including fraud, money laundering, and murder. Halat was tried and convicted in the summer of 1997, a full decade after the crimes were committed. He was sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. Also tried and convicted were Kirksey Nix and Thomas Holcomb, the hitman. Both were sentenced to life. Larray Sharp, Nix's girlfriend, got five years. I think a lot of citizens in Biloxi now realize that there are a lot of dedicated professional law enforcement people who will do everything they can to uh, protect the community and work hard to solve major crimes. Uh, perhaps the uh, legacy, you might say, of the case for the criminal element is that they realize after seeing this case that they can commit a crime one day and think they're getting away with it a year later, but it could come back uh, 10 years later and get them. While the Sherry's killers were finally brought to justice, Margaret Sherry's dream of a Biloxi free of gambling was never realized. Instead, Biloxi has become a resort town filled with casinos and neon lights. The sleepy southern town is gone forever, along with the woman who lost her life trying to save it.